Well, this morning, I'm, again, we're continuing in our series on faith and action. And uh, this morning, I, I don't know about you, but I'm a person who I want to know when I'm making something, when I'm building something, when I'm fixing something. I want to know what it looks like when I'm doing it right, and I want to know what it looks like when I'm doing it wrong. Okay? Because if something is starting to go wrong, I want to be able to recognize it. Um, you know, this, this past week we had somebody in our church, their brake line uh, ended up becoming disconnected on their way to work. Right? And so he's hitting the brake and nothing's happening. Right? Now, what's funny about that is he's not going to blame the brake pedal, right? Because the brake pedal is a symptom of something that's taking place deeper within the car. But if he recognizes that the brake pedal is not working, that's a sign of something going wrong, right? Or when we, there's a, there's a whole bunch of, like when we're building the furniture piece, like I talked about last week, building Ikea furniture, which again, drives me nuts. All right, just building Ikea furniture is the worst. But you start to recognize, obviously I didn't put this piece on right because there's legs going down and legs going up, and there's only one ground. So all the legs should be on the one side. Like You recognize that because it's something going wrong, and you know to correct it. So it's not just when things go right that we need to be able to recognize, but we need to be able to recognize when we're heading in the wrong direction. And James helps us out so much in this passage of Scripture that we're going to read today because he helps us recognize when things are going right, and he helps us recognize when things are going wrong. When we are on the wrong path, certain things are going to show up. Certain things are going to pop up. And so in verse 13, it starts out with a very familiar, different words. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Let's pray this morning. God, I thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that you would move today. God, I pray that you would speak to the heart and the mind of the person in this room. God, I pray that you would challenge us, that you would encourage us, and ultimately that you would bring us to a closer relationship with you. In your name I pray. Amen. So he starts off, James, with this show what you believe. Show, show, show. How many of you are sick and tired of hearing James telling you to show, to act, to walk the talk, Whatever you want to say, James tells us over and over again. I'm pretty sure every week James has said something to us along the lines of, make sure you do what you believe. Live it out. And he says it again in this passage of Scripture. We cannot, listen, it's, it's going to drive you nuts because it's just going to keep happening until we're done this series around the end of July, okay? But it's going to keep happening because it's that important. When you're having a conversation with somebody and you don't want to forget, you don't want them to forget that important thing, you say it as many times as you need to until you know that they remember it. For those of you who have ever had a conversation with a toddler or a seven-year-old, when you are asking them to do something, you have to tell them probably five times minimum for them to understand. I mean, having a conversation with my three-year-old Caleb, it's something simple. He'll be standing here, and there'll be shoes 10 feet away. And I'll say, Caleb, go pick up your shoes. And literally, he just looks around like, I'm like, dude, your shoes are right there. He's like, what? Pick up your shoes. Caleb, I want you to go pick up your shoes. And I'll say it over and over again until I know that he gets it, and he starts moving in that direction. <laughs> because, right, he'll just, he'll just keep walking, and he'll just do whatever. I don't know what you're talking about, Dad. I don't want to do that. No, but when I recognize he's moving in the right direction, I'm like, all right, I don't need to tell him anymore. He's going to finally do it. And James is doing the same thing to us and to the people that he's writing to. He wants them to understand, hey, you cannot forget that it's not just what you believe, but you have to live out what you believe. But James, this is why I love today. He unpacks for us the symptoms of what takes place when we have our relationship with God beginning to fall apart and we have our relationship with God growing. You know, a runny nose, 
A runny nose it could be a symptom of a lot of different things, right? You know, it could be a symptom of the common cold. It could be a symptom of something much bigger, uh, pneumonia, whatever you want to say. A runny nose could be a lot of different things. I don't know if it's a symptom. Of, is it a symptom of pneumonia? It could be, exactly. I don't know. You're nodding your head, so I just looked at you. But it could be a lot of different things. Exa allergies. It could be any. And so what we have to do is we have to say, okay, what symptom can I recognize and what am I going to be able to tie it back to? Now, the good news for us is that we're not dealing with 30, 40, 50, hundreds of different viruses and infections. No, we're dealing, with, we're dealing with good and evil. We're dealing with right and wrong. We're dealing with God and the devil, which, by the way, they're not on the equal level. I'm just putting them on opposite sides of the spectrum. God is already victorious. Jesus has won the battle. The enemy has lost, but I'm just talking two different sides, all right, just so you know. But... Today, what we're going to look into is our actions. What symptoms are we seeing displayed in our life? Today is kind of that maintenance check on your life. And we need to allow the Word of God to penetrate dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Let it judge the thought and attitude of your heart today. Earlier I had you pray for other people in the church, but right now what I want you to do is look at yourself. Don't worry about the person next to you. Look at your heart. Look at your life. Do the maintenance check on yourself, all right? The first thing I want us to understand is your actions are extremely important. Again, your actions are extremely important because they lead us to what's actually going on inside of our heart. Verse 14, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So James here contrasts these two kinds of wisdom. Wisdom from the enemy, wisdom from within ourselves, and wisdom from God. And in this picture, the two symptoms of wisdom are very different, right? We see these two symptoms that rise up. We see harboring envy, selfish ambition in your hearts, boasting, denying the truth, earthly-minded, unspiritual. All of these things are from the devil. And they will result in disorder in your life. But purity, peaceable, considerate, willing to yield, merciful, impartial, sincere, will result in good fruit and righteous or good action. When we start to see any of these symptoms rise up in our life, it's not just something that happens. We tend to, we tend to want to believe that sometimes things just happen out of nowhere. Like, man, I just... I just looked at that bad website out of nowhere. I, should, I know I shouldn't. I just happened. No, 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 no. Something has already taken place in your heart, and you made the decision to go to that website, right? And so we, what we have to do is it's not just the action that we have to tie ourselves to. No. What is going on deeper below the surface that you're not seeing? Because what you recognize is the symptom. But you have to tie it back to what's going on inside of your heart. Envy, for those of you who don't know, is being jealous of someone or someone something. Selfish ambition, being the desire to put yourself above someone else, or more, import or more importantly, what God wants to do. Boasting in yourself and your abilities would be arrogance. Denying the truth of these things taking place in your heart is also a symptom that must be battled. When these things begin to take place, more and more, you will find your thoughts becoming more and more of this world and less and less of those of Christ. But when we stay close to Jesus, when we ask him for wisdom, we find ourselves on the opposite end of the spectrum. In fact, when we, let's, let's James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So we're talking about wisdom today. And James here 
he, he kind of puts it full circle for us. He brings us all the way back to chapter 1. One of the first sentences he writes, if you want wisdom from God, ask for it. Ask for it. The problem is when we need wisdom, we don't want it in the moment. When we have the decision that we're facing, what we have to do, I talked about it last week, we have to step back when we're making a choice and we have to ask for wisdom. But the problem is when we have to make a choice, for some reason we as humans think that we need to make the decision right away or we're going to miss it. Right? We're going to miss that opportunity. And what we need to say is, no, hold on. I don't need to rush this. I'm going to step back and I'm going to ask God to give me wisdom in this situation to help me live it out. This is why studying the scripture is extremely important because there are some things we need to pray about because it's a practical application and we can't tie it directly to scripture, okay? But, I said directly, you can always tie it to scripture. Directly is the operative word there. But, there are certain things that are simply right and wrong, and if you look to the scripture, you don't have to make a decision because the decision has already been made for you. God tells us we shouldn't lie. So when you have the option to lie or not lie, you should choose not to lie. And if you want to lie, then you have to step back and say, hold up, I need you, God, to give me the wisdom to handle this situation the right way. It all comes back to wisdom from God. A follower of Jesus is considerate when it comes to the people around him. This is, again, these are symptoms. Are you a considerate person? How do my actions and my words affect the person that I'm interacting with in this situation? You know, my mom was here last week, and if there's one thing, and my sister can testify to this, if there's one thing my mom taught me growing up, and the Holy Spirit used her in this way, is my mom taught me to be considerate. Um, to the point where it was annoying. All right? That's right. That's right, because for me, for me, naturally, I'm not a considerate person. It's harder for me to do that, okay? And I know that because I still have that battle going on in my head. All of us are naturally inclined to certain things, okay? I'm naturally inclined to be self-focused. That's just, who, I'm just being real with you, okay? Your pastor has his own struggles. But thankfully, I've overcome that struggle because my mom, through the, the Holy Spirit, through my mom, trained me to be considerate of other people. So now when I'm going to have a conversation with somebody, I, my wife will testify to this. I become really annoying because I play out so many scenarios in my head of how another person might respond. She's like, you need to not worry about that. I'm like, no, I'm trying to be considerate of what's going on. She's like, okay, that makes sense. My mom trained me that way because the Holy Spirit led her to do that. A lot of times what we want is we want God to move in our life directly from God, but what we need to do is we need to tie ourselves to somebody who's going to be used by the Holy Spirit to train us in something specific. That's why church is important. You want to know why church is important? Because you can't grow in the Lord all by yourself. You can't. You don't just become... I, I, there are people in this room who are far ahead of me in regards to the way that they do certain things spiritually. Okay? And I look up to those people. We all need to recognize who the people are around us that can help us. And we need to be willing to ask. Hey, I, I, I recognize that you, you serve like nobody I've ever met before. And I really just don't want to do anything all ever. <laughs> like whatever it looks like for you. Can, you. can you explain to me why you serve? Can you explain to me why you do the things you do? Can you show me what it looks like to serve in the ministry that you're serving in? And what will end up happening is you'll, you'll kind of catch, you'll catch their heart because the Holy Spirit then is able to use that person to train you up to be a servant. That was a side note, by the way. So moving forward. So consider it. Willing to yield. Being merciful. Are you a person that always has to be right? I'll look down. Are you a person that's merciful? Again, these are, these are things, these are symptoms. 
if you, if you find yourself more jealous, if you find yourself more selfish ambition coming out of you, if you find yourself boasting more, you're, that's a symptom of something going deeper on in your heart. But if you're seeing yourself being peaceable, if you're seeing yourself being considerate, if you're seeing yourself being merciful, then that's a good sign of what's taking place deeper inside of you. And that one of the things that he writes about, oh, I love it, is a huge symptom. Sincere, genuine, authentic. If there's one thing that I know my generation can't stand, um, it's, it's inauthenticity, it's disingenuineness, it's fake. I would rather you not be nice to me. I would rather you say nothing than fake being nice to me. I'm just, that's just, that's the way our generation is. Because we want you to be genuine. We want you to be real. Okay? And so what ends up happening is we as Christians need to be the most real people out there. We need to be the most genuine people out there. And the only way that can happen is if we can tie our relationship with Jesus Christ to everything that we do. Listen, we're, we're, we're always going to have battles going on inside of our mind. We're going to have these decisions we have to make. But ultimately, the only way we can be genuine as a believer is if our relationship with Jesus Christ is solid enough that when we make the right decision, it truly comes from our heart. It may start in your mind, but it has to be tied to your heart. Because the second thing I want you to understand is symptoms will follow the truth. You know, a couple weeks ago we talked about the reservoir and how our relationship with God is, we're filling this reservoir and when we cut off our relationship with God, we're still pulling from that reservoir that we've pulled. But ultimately at some point that reservoir of our relationship with Jesus Christ will be gone. And the truth will come out. Or, or, if you continue to read your Bible, continue to pray, continue to allow other people, other Christians to encourage you, then one day it will come out that you are a growing disciple of Jesus. Because ultimately what you have to do is you have to keep moving forward because one day the truth will come out in the symptoms of your life. You know, I have, a, I have a bike up here, and everybody keep make, kept making the joke, Pastor, are you going to run away today? I'm not running away. I am actually leaving, like, right after service today. I'll probably say amen, say a few goodbyes. If anyone needs to talk to me, see me right away. Um, I will be gone this week. I am the director for middle school camp uh, for Ohio Youth Ministries, so I'm excited for that. It's going to be a busy week. Um, if you need to call me for any specific reason, uh, pull out your bulletin. There's an emergency number on the back. Call that number. Um, if you don't need me or if you think you might need me but you're not sure, don't call me. Um, I'm just <laughs> I'm directing a camp of hundreds of students and a bunch of leaders, so it's going to be fun. Uh, I'm not going to have them call Doug. Uh, so, but just, just so you know, that's where I'll be this week, so the office will be shut down because um, that's where I'll be. But... Uh, this morning, the bike is up here for a very important reason, and I, I use this illustration a lot, actually. I'm going to move this. See, the purpose of this bike is not to be looked at. Okay? The purpose of this bike is for me to be able to hop on and ride this bike, which I'm not going to do because I'm wearing jeans. I have to be able to ride this bike. But ultimately... If I were to hop on this bike right now, I, you, some of you may be able to see. If I push down on this, you'll see a couple of things. What are you seeing when I push down on this bike? Tires are super flat. I haven't ridden my bike in a while. If I were to start pedaling this bike, and there was a problem when I was pedaling, you know, sometimes if you've ever ridden a bike, sometimes when you pedal, you'll, you'll kind of get caught. You'll get jammed, and then you have to pedal through it, and you pedal and pedal and pedal. It's not the pedal's fault that there's a jamming taking place because there's something deeper going on. Ultimately, what it comes back to is this chain and the cogs that this chain runs on. And what I can have a, I can, I can be really dumb if I want to, 
And if I start having problems with my pedals, I can be like, oh, I need to work on the pedal. But that would do nothing for me. Because ultimately, as much as I could replace pedal after pedal after pedal, but ultimately the root cause of the problem is the chain or the car. Or some of us, if you've ever gardened before, you know, you know, there's, there's fruit trees, there's tomato plants, all this stuff. Um, if you, so there's, there's, let's just say tomato plant, because a lot of people do that. All right, you have a tomato plant growing, right? How many of you spray the tomatoes once they start budding, hoping that that's going to make that plant healthy? And you allow the plant root to wither and dry. No, that sounds really dumb. Because no matter what you do to the fruit, if the root is not healthy, then that fruit will not be healthy. You see, the biggest problem we have as Christians is we care too much about our fruit and not enough about our root. And we care too much, we care too much about other people's fruit, and we try to help them with their fruit rather than saying, hey, how is your root? How is your relationship with Jesus? You see, the things we listed today, these are symptoms. These are symptoms of something deeper taking place in our life. You know, Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's not the fruit of yourselves. It's not the fruit of your work. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit moving in your life. If you want to see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control develop in your life, then work on your root, your relationship with Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. Then you will see those things begin to develop. Stop worrying about your fruit and start worrying about your root. Stop worrying about other people's fruit and start worrying about their root. That's why I always say, if you know somebody who doesn't know Jesus, don't worry about the way that they talk. Don't worry about the way that they live. What you need to worry about is their relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus is going to be the one that changes them, not you. If the worship team would come this morning. That final verse, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Ultimately, there will be a harvest of what you sow into your life. The choice is, are you going to sow into your relationship with Jesus, or are you going to simply sow into yourself? Are you going to sow into your relationship with Jesus so that one day you will reap the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Or are you going to choose to not sow into that? Because here's the reality. You're either sowing into Jesus or you're sowing into yourself and the enemy. We all, have, we all make that choice. You don't stay stagnant in your relationship with Jesus. Jesus is unchanging, but our relationship is ever-changing. Because we are ever-changing. And so we need to be tied to him. This morning, when you recognize a fruit problem, when you recognize the self-ambition, when you recognize the unwilling to yield, when you recognize all of these things beginning to take place, and you say, the fruit of my life right now is obviously not tied to the root that I want to be tied to. You don't say, man, I need to stop doing this. You should be saying, man, I really need to get closer to Jesus. So this morning, the worship team, I told you, we are going to end really early today. They're going to sing one song, maybe two, I don't know. This morning, what I want you to do is water your root. Water your root take care of your relationship with Jesus this morning. Look at your fruit. Recognize where you're at. For some of you, you may be seeing the fruit of the Spirit. 
wisdom from above displayed in your life, and that's a positive thing. Keep taking care of it. Keep taking care of your relationship with Jesus. But some of us may have been allowing, and you've been seeing this fruit of the enemy develop. And what we need to do is we need to say, Jesus, I, I, obviously there's something going on inside of me that I need to correct. So draw me closer to you in this moment. And some of you may have never planted yourself with Jesus. You may have never started that relationship with Jesus and said, Jesus, I give you my life. I'm tired of living in such a way that I have no idea what's going on. I'm tired of living my life in such a way that I see all of these things that I just don't like about myself, this anger, this selfishness. God, ultimately what I want to do is I want to be tied into you. I want to see love develop in my life because you have given me love so I can show love. I want to be able to show mercy because you have given me mercy. I want to give grace because I have received grace. I want to give peace because I have been given peace. Because here's the reality. Why do you see the fruit of the Holy Spirit develop in your life? Because you recognize what Jesus has done for you. So this morning, we're going to pray, and the altars are going to open. And we have a choice to make. Will we take care of our root with Jesus? Or will, or will we continue to allow ourselves to be planted in a place we shouldn't be? Today, the choice is yours. If you've never received Jesus, all you have to do is say, Jesus, I give you my life. And then what we talked about earlier is identify somebody in this room. It could be me. It could be somebody that you know who's already a follower of Jesus and you need to talk to them and say, hey, I want to live for Jesus. What does that look like? What does it look like to live for Jesus? It all starts with just spending time with him, right? Right? I'll just start with spending time with Jesus. So I'm going to pray. The altars will be open. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you so much for your love. God, it's ultimately our relationship with you that changes us. God, we, we, don't, we don't work. We don't work at the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit develops because of what you have done in us and through us. And Jesus, I pray today, God, that for the person in this room who's seeing the fruit of the devil begin to take part in their life, I pray that they would just give that over to you and they would tie their roots deeper and deeper into what you would have for them. Jesus, I thank you so much because ultimately you are going to be the one who changes us. We don't have to do it. We don't have to do it because it's going to be you. Be with us as we pray. May we have an encounter with you and your spirit. In your name I pray. Amen.